associated with the new covenant blood. This is a passage we always read on the first Sunday of the month when we do our Eucharist. As often as you do. I want to talk about the blood of the new covenant. A lot of people talk about the blood of Christ, but they don't talk about the blood of the new covenant. He took the cup also after supper. This, of course, could be found in Luke 22, 20, the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. Uh, when he described to them the change that was coming to this cup, the cup he was holding was the cup of the old covenant of shadow Christology in the blood, and it was about to be changed to his blood. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This was a new, a new theology statement to his disciples from an old messianic prophecy of the Old Testament. It wasn't a new one. The new covenant was prophesied way back in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. New covenant. The new covenant would not come until the Messiah came. But he, it was a, a messianic covenant. It was very clear. Everybody, even the opponents of Christ, understood that the new covenant was messianic. There's no doubt about that. It was a big covenant in the Jewish faith. But it was based on the coming of Christ. Their problem wasn't that they didn't believe the new covenant came with Christ. They didn't believe it came with Jesus of Nazareth. And many still don't. And that's where the tragedy of this whole thing. So he told his disciples, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. This was quite a dawning theological statement to them. It shouldn't be to you and I. One of the sad things about what's happened to the modern church is they don't teach on the new covenant. They teach more on the old covenant than they teach on the new covenant. And we are not old covenant people. We are new covenant people. We are not old covenant people. We are new covenant people and we know little about it. And that's a shame. This thing has been in existence for 2,000 years and we know little about it. A lot of people t t teach on the blood of Christ, but they don't teach it to understand that it's new covenant blood. What, 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 what is he talking about here? This, he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we're talking about what we have done. He said, when, when you take part in the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, communion, however you want to think of it. We think of it here in this church as Eucharist because of the word giving thanks. If you, if you recall from this passage in verse 24 when he talks about the bread, the word giving thanks is where you get the word Eucharist in the Greek language means giving thanks. To be grateful for God's grace is what it actually means so that you have a thankful heart. Grace should give you a thankful heart. Work shouldn't. Works is wages. Grace is gift. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself is a gift. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. So the writer, uh, Paul, has laid this thing out 
uh, as, a, as a new covenant theological doctrine. So what we have been doing is talking about the blood of Christ in the cup. Because listen, here's what people miss. As often as you, watch what he says now in verse 25. Do this as often as you drink it in what? In remembrance. Remembrance of what? What's the cup represent? The blood of Christ. So you're to remember that the cup represents the blood of Christ. And what did the blood of Christ give you why is the cup of the blood of Christ important so here's what we've done we've told you the nine doctrines connected the nine things the nine new covenant doctrines connected to the blood of Christ the content so when you drink now we give you grape juice when you drink the juice the contents of the cup your mind should be reflecting on the salvation of the blood of Christ, what it has secured for you by grace, not by works. For example, this there are nine doctrines connected to that. To your mind, what did he say to do this and what? Say it. What? What? Remembrance. That's recall. Remembrance. You can't remember something you don't know. Right? Can't remember something you don't know. And so what we have done over the last nine weeks is we've studied each doctrine that's in the cup. For example, what does that cup represent to you under the new covenant? Reconciliation. So we studied the doctrine of reconciliation. Redemption. Propitiation, justification, purification, peace with God, forgiveness, victory in the angelic conflict, and today, the blood of the new covenant. And let me ask you a question. I don't want an answer. <laughs> this between you and God. Do you take... In your church, do you take part in communion? Do you take part in the Eucharist? Right? If you do, you're supposed to do what? You're supposed to do this and what? Remember. Remember, it's about what of the cup? About the blood, the blood of Christ. What did the blood of Christ secure for you? All the passage that we studied deals with the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ in reconciliation, the blood of Christ in redemption, the blood of Christ in propitiation, the blood of Christ. You understand? Now we're at the blood of Christ of the new covenant. Out of that passage. And so we, 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 we looked at all nine doctrines over the last, last nine weeks. We have looked at this. We have studied it. And now when you take part in this, you should be able to do this. And Remember, you ought to understand reconciled by the blood of Christ. These are nine things that every believer receives at the point of salvation that he should call to remember in remembrance or recall when you, every time you take part in the Eucharist. Would you agree with that? Well, we should come into agreement on that. And so, if you've never studied these nine doctrines, you can pick them up off our website, doctrinalstudies.com. You can pick them up. Look for this specific series on Sunday that, that we're in our ninth lesson today. And so, we're going to talk about the new covenant. It is the blood of the new covenant. And we're going to talk about that after a word of prayer. Remember that the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. That means, again, it's a book for the redeemed of the Lord. Those who believe that Christ died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day called the gospel, 
It is the power of God to save those who believe it. And therefore, you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God. But the moment you got saved, you received nine works of the Holy Spirit under the new covenant. One of those was the indwelling. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What? Don't you know that your body became the temple of God when you believed the gospel? It became the temple of God. Your body became the temple of God, the naos, the place where the blood of Christ cleansed it, a place where the blood of Christ does the cleansing. Your body, the moment you believed that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, the moment you believed, your body was changed from corruptible to incorruptible in the sense that your body became the temple of God. And when you die, at the rapture, you're going to receive an incorruptible body because you have an inc incorruptible soul saved by the blood of Christ. Now, the problem isn't that not that you're not saved, and the problem is not if you believe the gospel, you're saved. It's not that you're not indwelt. The moment you believed, you were indwelt. Galatians 3, 2 says at the moment of salvation, you received the Holy Spirit. That's what makes you a spiritual person. The problem is not that. The problem is you can be a carnal believer or a spiritual believer, 1 Corinthians 3. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. And if you're aware of that, you will be if the Holy Spirit has any activity in your life. You will be aware of it, and once you're aware of it, you're to confess it. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. And that allows you to study the Bible as a spiritual person under the ministry of the Holy Spirit to get the spiritual truth that sets you free from the cosmic system of lies, John 8, 32. So let's do that, and then we'll have our morning study. Let's do that. Every head bowed, every eye closed, or if you privacy to yourself and others around you. As a believer priest, according to 1 Peter 2, you have the privilege and responsibility to confess personal sin whenever you're aware of it. So that you can be a spiritual person in the devil's world. That you can be the salt of the earth and the light of the world for Christ. And so, our Father, we thank you today for all that your grace has provided us and your mercy has given us. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the blood of the new covenant to us, Father, as we look at the new covenant and the dynamics of it for our, our life, because this is the dispensation of the new covenant. This is the dispensation that introduces it to the world. So I thank you for that privilege, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that's kind of interesting in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-five 25 is the way it's written in the Greek language. So I want you to pay attention with me just for a moment. This cup is... See, the definite article with the cup. This cup is the new covenant, predicate nominative, predicate nominative, new covenant and cup are identified together in my blood. Do is a command. It's a present active imperative, second person plural. That's a command to all of us who participate. Every believer, when the, offer, when the Eucharist is offered, is commanded to participate. There is a certain way you should participate in it, which Paul goes into detail in 1 Corinthians 11. So he says, do this, puts it in a command, as often as you drink it, 
Now, what is not seen in your English is the third class condition, if. It is not seen in the English translation. It is found in the translation in the English as often as. It is a third class condition. And the word drink is a present active subjunctive. As often as you drink. Or when the occasion, if, the, the third class condition in this setting after a command is interesting because you've had a command to do this and now you're given a third class condition whenever the circumstances arise you have a volitional responsibility because a subjunctive mood is the mood of possibility based on volition. It's conditional. As often as you drink it in remembrance. One of the works of the Holy Spirit in John 14, 26, under the New Covenant, would be to recall pertinent doctrine. He the Holy Spirit teaches and recalls. Teach and recall. Now, here's what's really interesting. When you have a third-class condition, the if, the if is normally first in translation, and then you have the then part, you have a protesis, if such and such, you have an apotesis, then such and such. Are you with me? Writer didn't do that. Paul did not do that. Paul put the apotesis first. He put the then, the then or the, the, the then part, not the if part. He said, do this preceding the protestants of the if. And so the writers of the English are struggling with how to bring this out in translation. How do I make this from, how do I take this from the Greek? and put it into the English where it makes sense for the common person. And they did a pretty good job with it. I don't know that we see the dynamics of what they said with the little phrase as often as. But it's pretty dynamic in the Greek language. Because they corrected it. They, they put it in more if then. Paul made a point by not, of not doing that in the Greek language. And when, a, when you do that in the Greek language, when you take a phrase that should be one way and put it backwards, it's for emphasis. It's for emphasis. It's for emphasis. You, you're trying to emphasize something. And what is he trying to emphasize? He's trying to emphasize this. You're commanded to drink the cup. Listen to me. What is important to you in the drinking of the cup is your remembrance of what the cup has provided for you of your salvation. So I did that my introduction. I made great emphasis on that. 
the emphasis is for you, the emphasis is to do, drink. With the emphasis on remembrance. Do you understand that? And I'm not sure that we put the emphasis where. But it should be. The emphasis should be on remembrance. When you drink the remembrance of the cup and the command to do it in remembrance is the issue. How are you going to remember what you don't know? That's my point. How are you going to remember? When the emphasis is on remember, when you drink, how are you going to remember what you don't know? And so people go through ritual without reality. They go through the motions of the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. They go through it. They drink the cup, but it has, it has no, no remembrance. It has no gratitude. It has no understanding of what Christ did for our salvation, what he took to replace. What did he take? He took our sins and judgment and condemnation and wrath and in place gave us reconciliation and redemption and propitiation and yada, yada. The Eucharist should be a solemn moment, both with the bread and the cup, but especially the cup. Especially the cup. Because the cup is about the blood and what the blood has purchased for you. So, as pastor of this church, I felt it important to come back and remind our people of how Paul laid this out and where he placed the emphasis. And so I've, I've done that for my people. It is important when we take part in the Eucharist that we do it in remembrance of what the purchase price for our salvation was and why we shouldn't take it lightly. So I've got three points this morning. We'll see how far we get. Don't matter how many points I put down, it's how many I complete. I'll tell you what's missing is people don't understand the five messianic covenants that are important. Five messianic covenants are really important. And they're interlinked. Now, when you look at these five, and I want you to look at point number one. When you look at these five, I want you to notice Adamic conditional. See that word conditional? I want you to circle it. Abrahamic, notice that's unconditional. Notice mosaic, it's conditional, circle that. Notice that the Davidic covenant is unconditional, and notice that the new covenant is unconditional. No conditions necessary or conditions are necessary. Are you with me? It's really important you understand that. Did you circle the two? That's why you come to church. There's a pencil in the pew. There's a reason why we call this class, church class. The two I ask you to circle are conditional. And here's what they're designed to do under point one. The two conditional covenants, Adamic and Mosaic. Here's what they're to do. Write this down. Did you write that they were conditional? I I wrote them for you. All I ask you to do is circle them. (laughs) I'm not fussing at you. Just stay in in class with me. All right. Now watch. Here's what I do want you to write down. Write it up there by conditional. 
you know, Adam, for example. Galatians 3, 24, 25. So let's take a look at Galatians. Because let's get these, let's understand how these two work. Did I call, did I tell you five messianic covenants? All right. <laughs> let's look at verse 24 and 25. Context, you're looking at 23 through the end of the verse 29. Context-wise, you're looking at 23 through 29. But I'm just showing you conditional, why they're, wh how they're conditional. Here's how they're conditional. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. The Mosaic law, like the Adamic law, are conditional laws. Conditional covenants are to do what? Conditional covenants like the Mosaic covenant and the Adamic covenant are conditional covenant. A conditional covenant, what's, what as far as Messiah, Christ, what was it supposed to do? What are they supposed to do? Lead you to Christ. Okay? When you look at unconditional covenants, they're all about Christ leading you. Christ comes and he fulfills them. The covenant doesn't lead you to Christ. Christ, Christ leads you to the covenant. Verse 25, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. There's your two conditional covenants, right? And then you have three that are unconditional. Conditional covenant leads you to Christ. An unconditional covenant, Christ leads you to covenant. That's basic, but that's... Now, th let's take a look at Adam's, the Adamic conditional covenant. In Genesis, the second chapter, first book in the Bible, you can turn there, unless you know it. I'm not impressed that you know it. I'm impressed that you know where it is. The, the second chapter, 15, then the Lord took the man, put, put, him in the, put him in the garden, cultivate and keep. The Lord commanded the man, saying from, watch this now, here's a commandment. There's two parts to this commandment. Here is a commandment. It's a conditional. Watch, there's two parts to it. Here's the first part. From any tree of the garden you may freely eat. You got that one? Here are all the trees. They say, eat, eat from any of them, all of them. From any tree of the garden you may freely eat. That's grace. Watch 17. But that's a contrast. This is adversative conjunction. But, <laughs> right? Watch for the fine print now. <laughs> That's fine, friend. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. This is a commandment. One part, eat from any tree. Second part of that commandment. But of the tree of knowledge you cannot eat. For explanatory, for in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. In the Greek language, that's muth, muth, cal imperfect to a cal infinitive or a cal infinitive to a cal imperfect, and it gives you an absolute. It's a way in the Hebrew to tell you, that's the, in the English, they translated it, surely. 
Actually, it says, dying you will die. Literally, it says, dying you will die in the Hebrew. In other words, it's going to involve two deaths. <laughs> One death is going to occur while you're still alive. That's spiritual death. Separation from God in time, and it depends on your volition if it's eternal. Because God will offer you salvation by grace as a gift. And if you receive it, then that spiritual death is turned to spiritual life that we call eternal life under the new covenant. After an Adam and Eve ate from that tree that day, they died spiritually. And they lived 900 years and, and more later and then died physically. Die and you will die. Revelation comes along. And says that if you die without Christ under spiritual death, that all men are born spiritually dead. If you die physically under that commandment of dying, you will die. You will experience a second spiritual death in eternity. If you live separated from God because you reject the gospel and you die in that state, you will now suffer a second spiritual death which is separated from God for all eternity. Book of, the book of Revelation. This is the, one of the great subjects of the book of Revelation. In eschatology the study of the last day. You see, when you're with Adam, you're in the first day. And in the book of Revelation, you're in the last day of human existence under that command, under that commandment. This is a conditional covenant. Would you agree with that? That's a conditional covenant. You're not to what? He told Adam, you're not to do what? Eat of the tree of knowledge. Now he could eat, but not of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat from it, dying, you will die. Did they eat from it? Yeah. And, and there we are, the human race. How do I know it? How do I know that Adam that ate from that tree is the federal head of the un unsaved world? I know it because of 1 Corinthians. Are you with me? 1 Corinthians 15. Let's go there. This is just one of many passages, but it just states it really clear. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For in Adam, that's how we're born, that's why we're a human race. Not vegetable, mineral, or animal. Although we may act like it. In Adam, all what? Yeah. You know what that is? Dying, you will die. You're born spiritually dead, and you will die physically. Thanks, Adam. I don't know anybody who sits around and thanks him for it. They thank God, though, that he corrects it. For an Adam all die, so also what? In Christ, how do I get from Adam into Christ? Colossians 1, 13, 14. Colossians 1, 13, 14. How do I get from in Adam to in Christ? Christ goes to the cross. He dies on the cross. He's buried. He's raised from the dead. That's called the gospel. When you believe the gospel, Colossians 1, 13, 14 says, God rescues you from the world of darkness and transfers you 
into the kingdom of the beloved Son in Christ. That's how you get out of Adam and into Christ. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's no other way. Jesus said it well when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father except through me. That's why he offers the cup of the Eucharist, and he says, this cup is my blood offered for the salvation of the world because of Adam's sin. You know why you need to be saved? Do you know why every human being needs to be saved? And why he cannot save himself is because of Adam's sin. In Adam's sin, we all die. In Christ's death, burial, and back to life, one is removed and the other is given, and that life is called eternal life. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45, for those who are interested, because you have your Bible open, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam, who is that? Christ. Is a life-giving spirit. And so, you see, the first covenant that's really important was a conditional covenant, and a conditional covenant according to Galatians, the third chapter, 24 and 25, is to do what? Leads you to what? Christ. The covenant leads you to Christ. There are other passages that would be of great importance to us. For example, in Genesis, the third chapter, 14, 15, and 16, when God puts judgment down on the serpent, the woman, and the man, he says something really interesting. Genesis, the third chapter. Here we are. 14, 15, 16. In judgment against the serpent, verse 14, he puts him cursed on the belly and then the dust in 15, it's a direct against Satan. It's directed against Satan who used the serpent. The book of Revelation makes it clear in the 20th chapter what we're talking about. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between Satan and the woman. Between your seed and her seed, you know who the seed of the woman is today? Christ, the church. You shall bruise him on the heel, and he will bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. You know why he's talking to Satan? Because of Romans 16, 20. Now, you don't pay any attention to this stuff. You like to, I guess you just like to hear stuff and come up with your own ideas. Nothing irritates me worse. The Bible is your answer book. The answer to that, if you have a good study Bible, will probably tell you, look at Romans 16, 20. Right? Should. It says Jesus Christ will crush, crush the head of Satan. In the second coming of Jesus Christ, he will crush the head of Satan. Second coming. You know what he does in the first coming? See how smart you are. You know what he does in the first coming? You know what he does with Satan in the first coming? Now he's going to crush him in the second coming, right? Romans the 16th chapter, verse 20. You know where I'm getting all this? Studied the Bible. I didn't study the Bible. You know why you come to this church? If you come and stay, it's because you want to study the Bible. If you don't come and stay, it's because you don't care about it. you just rather come up with your own ideas. So here we are in 1 John. 
Here we are. This is what Christ does in his first coming. We know what he's going to do in his second coming. He's going to crush his head. That's good. And listen, you know who believes it more than you? Satan. But he believes that. Whether you believe it or not, he knows it to be true because God said it. That'd be wise for us all to get on that page. Here I am in 1 John 3, 8. Here's what he does in the first coming. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. Yep. The son, of, the son of God appeared for this purpose, first coming, that he might destroy the what? Works. Not destroy Satan. He won't be destroyed till the second coming of Christ, and you can read about it in the 19th chapter and the 20th chapter of Revelation. But what he did in the first coming was he destroyed his works. You see, works, listen, works is all about the devil. Grace is all about God. He came to destroy the works of the devil. Let me tell you, he loves to put his foot into your life. You know how he does it? Works. You say, well, what about the book of James? I'll tell you what James is talking about. He's talking about divine productions of faith. And if you don't know that, you ought to pick us up because on Wednesday night, I'm teaching from the book of James, and I'm in the fifth chapter, so you've missed four. In verse 16 of Revelation, or uh, of Genesis 3.16, let me go back. Apparently, I'm not going to get very far today. Listen, I get far enough if you'll believe anything. My job is to bring the information and you to put faith in it. I can't put faith in you, but I can put information on you. Here's what he says to the woman. Here's what he says to the woman who was involved in the fall of mankind. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. Well, yeah, I bet you hate that one, don't you, girls? I bet you hate that one. Where is the seed against Satan going to come from? His seed, Satan's seed. Look. Look at verse 15. Let me help you. Let me help you. Look at verse 15. Let me help you. I will put enmity between you and the woman between your seed, Satan, and her seed. Right? The seed of the woman, the seed of the woman is going to take us all the way in Luke, the third chapter. Luke, the third chapter, is going to take the seed of the woman. All right, look. I'm just paid to teach, I, you know. Thank you. But I teach this whether I was paid or not. I hope you know that. Are you turning to Luke, third chapter with me? It's important. I wouldn't ask you if it wasn't. Third chapter. Go the very last verse of the chapter. The son of Eshu, Eshu, Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. 
whoa, wait a minute. What happened to Abe and Cain, uh, Cain and Abel? Seth is the third child, third child. What happened to the two other kids? There's a firstborn, a secondborn. Seth is a thirdborn. What happened to the other two? Well, you know the story, don't you? Murder and exile. So we have this seed of the woman, of Eve, the woman. You know when her name, you know when she was given a name? Huh? You know she has a name. The woman, she, she's called woman. Until verse 20 of Genesis 3. She's not called Eve. Until the 20th verse. And that's after the fall and the judgment. And her name, name means living one. She's the mother of the living. Are you with me? But the seed, she's the mother of the living, but the seed is what's important to the plan of God, not the fact that she's the mother of the living. She had Cain and Abel. It didn't come out too good. I mean, they came out good, but you know what I mean. The outcome. You see, we start with Seth because he's the seed. Now watch. Are you with me? Now we go, for, we go with a woman's seed. Talked about in verse 15, explained in verse 16. Now look, we're going we're gonna to run... We're at the very last of the ch chapter 3 of Luke. Are you with me? We run our finger up all the way up until we get to verse 23. See, we started from the bottom of the page, and we're going to the top. Are you with it? Verse 23. Because, you see, it started with Adam. We went from the first Adam to the last Adam. Or if you were reading from the normal Greek, uh, Luke 3, you went from the last Adam to the first Adam. But to make my point, I went from the last. Yeah, I went back, backwards on it just to make a point. Because we're talking about the woman's seed, which is Christ. The woman's seed is Christ. That's the point. And the seed of the woman is Christ, the Savior of the world, to correct the problem of Adam in the human race. Do you understand that? Golly, bum, I'm out of time. <laughs> well, look, don't go anywhere with me. Now look at verse 23. Now we're going to have a cup of coffee and a donut, okay, at halftime. You come downstairs and have a, have, a, have a cup of coffee and a donut. Here's how this, here's how it began in verse 23. I started from the bottom, worked my way to the top. When he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being supposedly the son of Joseph, the son of Eli. Look at We're talking about Jesus Christ, who is the seed, the, the physical reason for the whole seed concept is the birth, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, born, born, conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary, Luke 1, 32 through 35. The seed has now been fulfilled. That whole seed business from the first Adam is now fulfilled in the last Adam, and the last Adam, Jesus Christ, and that's going to bring you into all of the unconditional covenants. Well, <laughs> I got point one in the first covenant done, and my lesson is over. All right? Tony has the second hour, has my second class. I'll be back next week. For those on the internet, same place, same time, same hour, uh, and we'll go through a second covenant. <laughs>
first covenant. These, these, two, uh, these two conditional covenants are so important for us to understand how the new covenant is superior because of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Whoa. Let's pray the men. I'll take the offering. If you're a guest, uh, by that you know whether you're a member or not. If you're a guest, you're a member if you come more than once. No, you have to come about three times, I suppose. I don't know. We have a sliding scale, apparently. The men will take an offering, but this, listen, this meal has been paid for. This is, we thank you for coming. Our Father, we're thankful for all that your grace has provided us. Looking at the new covenant, Father, what a wonderful day. And what a wonderful day to be alive in the kingdom for Christ. The church age, wow, Father, it's the age of the introduction of the new covenant to the world and to the church. What a wonderful thing this is, Father, for us. And I pray, Father, as we get into the knitting gritty of all of this over the next few weeks, we would teach our people the, just the phenomenal time we live under the new covenant of the church age. Nothing like it ever, Father. We're so thankful that you chose us to live in this period of time rather than any other period. Take this offering, Father, and may we be good missionaries around the world with the gospel of Christ, a message of grace, a message of grace. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.